Hey guys, how's it going? Today I want to give you an update tour on how all of our fruiting plants are doing. So all of our fruit trees and berries. And a couple of our fruit trees need to be thinned as well, especially the espalier pear behind our greenhouse. So most of the stuff that we're going to look at today, they're brand new. We just planted our small orchard out on the new property this spring. Uh, the raspberries are brand new, but they're starting to look so much better than they did earlier. Uh, the only things I think that we're going to look at that I've had in previous years uh, is the miniature peach tree that I have in a container by the chicken coop and the pear tree behind our greenhouse. So I thought we would start behind the greenhouse. That tree is looking phenomenal and it needs some attention in terms of fruit thinning. So let's head that direction. All right, so here we are back behind the greenhouse. See, this is where our, uh, like our two neighbors and our property meet. See, they've got a shed in the back there. They've got their shed and then we kind of have all of our stuff back here, but I wanted something pretty. Also, our neighbors have little raised beds back there full of really wonderful looking produce, actually. But here is our Shinseki Asian pear. And it is so incredibly loaded with fruit. It's starting to weigh the branches down. And I'm really worried, like, I was worried when it was pouring rain the other night that the branches were just gonna snap, especially that one right up there. Isn't that just incredible? Look at this. Here's the lowest branch right here just amazing but this like we can't have this we've got to thin this both for you know reducing stress on the branch and then also allowing the fruit to develop larger real quick though right below the shinseki pear we've got some um, tuscan sun heliopsis right heliopsis <laughs> and recently i cut back the salvia that was in here so i've got several kind of mounds of salvia that will come back there are four in there and they bloomed beautifully and they really fill in this lower area and then there are some strawberries in here that i planted last year they're kind of going all around the edges here and then i did pop some annuals in the empty spaces so we've got some um superbina what is that coral red red coral something like that this is the vista jazzberry supertunia we've got royal velvet uh some evolvulus here blew my mind and then in the second raised bed, I've got the trellis or the, yeah, the trellis. And we've got cascade hops going on. They're looking pretty good. I mean, they're really starting to form up nice. They have some kind of crunchy leaves, but they get, they, they get nailed by wind. I mean, you can see there's nothing blocking wind. The poor plants just, they're not protected at all. And then down below, I've got some nepeta, which I cut back at the same time I cut back the salvia. There are three in here. There are also strawberries around the edges here. I kind of cleaned those up too. They needed to be groomed. And then I've got Supertunia Vista Fuchsia. Um, yeah. Looking pretty good though, overall, I think. So a few details on the Shinseki pear, and I am standing in the shade as close to the greenhouse as possible. It is warm out today. Um, but I got this tree last year. Aaron got it for me for my birthday, planted it late April, and I didn't get any fruit on it last year. So I didn't really know what to expect it to do. I had done some reading on the variety, and it did say that this variety tends to overproduce blossoms and fruit, which I can completely understand now. So when I was reading, it said you can thin out the blossoms when it's in bloom, but I didn't, I wasn't brave enough to do that. I clearly didn't do that. I wanted to see how many fruit it would actually set. It sets a lot. Um, it said that a mature specimen of this variety, like anything, you know, like five, six, seven years old, can produce upwards of 500 pears per tree. That's insane. <laughs> that is so many that has so many pears. And it stays naturally a little bit smaller in stature than your other like semi-dwarf trees like I have out in our orchard. So it wants to grow about eight to 10 feet tall and wide in its natural form. Of course, mine is trained into an espalier, so we'll kind of keep it the same shape. So you can see here just how the fruit is shaped. It's just gonna be more naturally round. And you also want to wait until this fruit is ripe to harvest it. And it won't be really, really soft because it's got more crisp flesh like an apple. But when they are ready, which is typically mid to late summer, I'm thinking it's going to be a late summer, early fall for us here. Um, typically, like if you put a little bit of pressure on it, it will give way a little bit, kind of like an apple. You can kind of tell if it's an apple is getting a little bit softer. That's what you look for in this type of pear. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get a bucket and I'm going to pull like this one right here is coming off. And this one right here, I want to make sure there's enough space and light around each one of these fruits that 
the ones that are remaining don't have to compete and they'll size up much better. I could have done this a lot earlier, you guys. It's a fairly straightforward process. It's a little painful to do, not gonna lie, but already that looks so much better. See how this one has much more space just naturally to form up. I just counted and from this little area, I pulled 11 pairs and we're left with two, four, six in their place which will have a much easier time now that they've got the kind of space they need. So anyway, I'm just gonna continue doing that to the whole entire plant. Hopefully the release of the fruit will help the branch start popping back up. If not, I might have to attach a horizontal stake and kind of help it out a bit. All right, here we go. a heck of a lot better oh my goodness I cannot believe how many pears I got out of that tree and there's still so many but if you take a look I don't think I need to thin it more I mean you can see air and space around each one of those pears and you could visibly see as I reduced the fruit load especially like right on the end that branch started to lift which made me happy because I thought I was gonna need to stake both of these uh, branches and I only had to stake the top one because that top one here you can see it's a little shorter and it's a little bit thinner diameter branch and it was weighted down all the way into this one so I ran a horizontal stake you can see some foam covered wire ties up there so that they don't damage the branches I attached it in a couple spots ran the stake over to the other side attached it in a few spots and then I ended up tying the stake like I tied a string to the stake and it goes down into another stake inside the raised bed and that just applied enough pressure to lift that side up a little bit more. And I anticipate needing to keep that on for this season, just till that wood hardens. And next year I'll know how to proceed better in a more timely fashion on the thinning procedure on this tree. And hopefully that weight issue won't happen again. But here's a little bit of a side view, super happy with it. So, so glad I decided to put raised beds back here. It's just kind of an unexpected, treat and surprise when you come back here. Okay, I'm in a full-on sweat at this point. We're gonna head to the miniature peach by the chicken coop. Oh my word, this is heavy. Huh. Okay, so our peach tree is right here. Planted this in a container a couple of years ago. You can see we're dealing with some chlorosis a bit. So it's been treated with chelated iron, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, I, I thinned some fruit the other night. <laughs> and just tossed them on the ground because I realized like how heavy these branches had become. You can see all of the fruit that this tree has set. So this miniature peach tree only grows six feet tall by six feet wide. Of course, it'll naturally stay a little bit smaller uh, if you keep it in a container, but I think I'll probably plant this out somewhere. It's not gonna be happy in this small container for much longer. But I'm actually surprised by the size of fruit that this tree produces. They're usually like, this big, really sweet, free stone, and uh, self-pollinating. You don't need to have more than one peach in order to get peaches off this one. So if you are in a situation where you don't have a huge space, this might be a really fun variety for you to try. But I do need to spend a few minutes thinning this one as well. Didn't have nearly as many peaches on that tree as we did the pears, but still a lot, dang. All right, so those are the only two fruit trees up here near the house. So let's head out to the orchard and the raspberries and blueberries out to that area. All right, let's talk about raspberries first. 
So these are the new berry beds we had put in this spring in this first one and we did a video um, boy I think it was April when we planted these uh, I think maybe it was beginning of May but this whole first bed is full of heritage raspberries which are an ever bearing red uh, berry they're really wonderful flavor nice big berry and the plants are looking so much better um, the poor things I planted them when they were kind of tender from a greenhouse and then we had a huge amount of wind and of course they got all burned and flopped over but they've really thickened up and they're starting to fill in just beautifully I did have to cut some of them all the way back so they're a little bit shorter uh, but I actually even saw that we're maybe going to get a few berries like they're starting to form some berries on the ends of some of these tips so these beds are 30 feet long so we have 30 feet of the heritage raspberries and they're three feet wide I think that'll work out great in this second bed I intend on filling this whole one with fall gold raspberries which is what these two plants are and they're actually looking really good too Look at that, we've got some berries starting right there. And the fall golds are a gold raspberry. They are also an ever-bearing type and they're non-crumbling, really sweet, just a really good berry. I only could get my hands on a couple plants so the rest of the bed is just full of random things that I planted just for this year that are looking good. I mean, we've got pumpkin on a stick right here, which this is a wicked looking plant. The tops of the leaves have thorns as well as the bottom of the leaves. Like, oh my goodness, we're starting to get some blooms though and such. We've got tomatillos in here, which are starting to form. See that right there, exciting. And then there's also an eggplant in here, sweet potatoes and a blue hubbard squash, which is looking kind of sad. And this last bed, you can see we haven't even put soil in it yet, but this is where our Prime Arc 45 blackberries are going. I have four already. I think I'm gonna be able to fit five or six in this bed. Um, so that one will be filled hopefully this fall and then we'll get those berry plants planted. And then back behind all three of these beds, uh, the beds actually measure three feet on the interior and then the boards are six inches each. So we've got four foot beds. So that's 12 feet for the beds. There's 16 feet, um, there's eight foot walkways in between. So we've got roughly to us at 28, <laughs> 28 foot uh, grape structure back here. It just spans the distance from the outer portion of this bed to the outer of this. Uh, so you can see right back here, we've got another little walkway that goes in back of all the beds. And then this is where we're gonna plant grapes next year. Just to be a nice green wall back here, I think it's gonna be really nice. And we'll probably go for like a red seedless type like Vanessa or Canada, something like that. Okay, blueberries next. And you can probably see the guys out there. So Benny is here getting ready to put, you can see all the flags the orange flags hopefully uh, we're getting ready to get uh, sprinklers put in this whole area so we can start our grass pathways so here you can see all the blueberries and tubs and then this is our orchard right here there are nine trees in here so we've got 11 blueberry plants total in these tubs and container there are two blueberries in here two in here, two, two, and then three in the last one. And I've since picked up eight more blueberry plants, so I think I'm gonna go get maybe three more tubs and kind of spread them all out evenly, and we'll just have more uh, lining this area here. So in this terracotta container, I have a Spartan and a Patriot planted together. Spartans so far have been my favorite in terms of flavor and size of berry. Um, I popped this Spartan one in this year. The Patriot was left over from an uh, experiment like a year or two ago. It's looking a little bit sad, but I have added some amendments into the pot and I think it'll be, it's much more consistently watered too because it's on drip, to, drip at this point. So I think it'll be a lot happier, but I do intend when I get the new tubs to pop these out and put them in tubs so that it can be pretty uniform back here. And then in the next three tubs, I have a blue crop. I think this is a blue crop. Yes, blue crop and blue gold planted together in each one of those containers. Now, all the blueberries just got scavenged by a bunch of robins. These were so heavily laden with fruit, especially the blue crop variety. Like this one right here was just absolutely loaded. And I noticed a bunch of birds out here the other day, didn't even dream that they'd be stealing all of our berries, but they did. So now I know that next time I need to net the fruit. So yeah, you can see right here, you can see all of these. Can you see that? Those were full of berries, full of berries. And those little buggers, they know which ones are ripe and which ones aren't. Full of berries and they're just gone. So sad. The strawberries though, these are the buried treasure pink right here. And there's also buried treasure white in here. And I think buried treasure red in some of these. 
and they've been doing really well. We've been keeping up pretty good on eating these. And then in this last container, these probably look the saddest. These are also Spartans and Patriots. Um, these were in, look at this. Uh, these were in one gallon size containers for two full seasons in our greenhouse. <laughs> They were incredibly pot bound. I planted them out. We'll see what happens. I knew this year they would look pretty bad. So I'm hoping that they will winter over okay and that they'll come back and look a lot better than they do this year. Okay, so now we'll take a little walk through the orchard and I'll just briefly touch on each variety I have, give you a little bit of information and show you what they look like. The apricots are done. Um, they both put on a huge amount of fruit. One I like way more than the other, but overall I'm really happy with how things are going out here. Okay, so this whole area is 95 feet long, wide, and 35 feet deep right here. All of these trees are semi dwarf so they grow roughly 15 to 20 feet tall and wide, and we space them maybe even too far. I mean, we could have probably spaced them a little bit closer, but I was trying to make sure that at maturity we would still have plenty of room to walk around this side of the trees, and then also they should barely touch at maturity. Um, so I really just wanted it to be easy to navigate and not kind of choke the area down too much with too much going on, if that makes sense. And honestly, we don't need more than this in terms of fruit. This is gonna be big time upkeep as it is. First tree right here is a Honeycrisp apple. I put apples flanking the outer fronts so that we could have white blooms. I was kind of trying to think of how it would look in the spring when they were all blooming. So we have another apple on that side, that far end. There's only one apple on this tree this year, which honestly is fine. First year, they tell you to take all the fruit off anyway and let the tree just kind of settle into its spot and root in. These are older trees and I'm not that patient. I let them fruit, usually don't have any issue. Um, so right here is the apple, Look how pretty that is. So sweet tart flavor, these are a zone four, so pretty winter hardy. They do require a pollinator though, so having one another apple in the area is a good idea. I've read a lot of different information on how far apart to space things. Um, you know, I've seen anywhere from, you know, space your pollinator trees 50 feet, within 50 feet of each other for best pollination, which is probably true. Some people say up to 500 feet is okay. Some people say 100 feet. I don't know, I think as long as they're kind of in the general area, general vicinity of each other, you'll be okay. Our neighbor, actually the one that we bought you can see the tip of their barn. The one we bought this field from, uh, they have a huge orchard on the other side of their house. It's really close by. Um, and there's another orchard nearby theirs as well. So I figured that we'd probably be okay. However, I do believe that the apples are the only two trees I have, have in this space that actually require a pollinator in order to get fruit. Um, so I made sure to have two apples in here. Right behind the Honeycrisp apple, we have a flavor top nectarine. Now, doesn't that tree look nice? I can't even believe how much it's grown. In fact, you can see, if you look in here, there's the old growth here. This is a new branch this year. Whoop, goes all the way up there. It's put on a tremendous amount of growth and it's got three nectarines on it and a wasp. Excellent, do you see that wasp in there? Ugh. You can see the nectarine behind and there's a nectarine right down here and there's one right here. So these will size up quite a bit more before we're ready to pick them. Um, they are self-pollinating, a self-pollinating variety, and they're freestone. Uh, and they have this just really pretty red blush on their skin and kind of a yellow-orange uh, flesh. Okay, right next to the Flavor Top Nectarine, we have a Santa Rosa Plum. We have been eating these like crazy. They are so good. See, if I would have thinned these, these would have been bigger, but hold on. Mmm. They are so absolutely delicious. I need another one of these trees in my life. Honestly, they're so good and Benjamin loves them. Hold on, I would have a snack. So this tree, the Santa Rosa, is a zone five. It's partially self-fertile. So while you will get fruit if you don't have more than one of these types of trees, uh, it, you will get more and you'll have better crop if you have more than one type of plum in the same area. That's why I say I need, I need to get another type of plum so I can have a couple different varieties in here. I just didn't realize I'd enjoy this so much. Almost every day after I get done working out here, I go inside and Aaron asks me if I'm ready for dinner, if I'm feeling hungry for dinner. And every day I'm kind of like, oh, 
not really. There's so many wonderful things out here to eat right now. Like for a while there, I was eating apricots like crazy. Now I'm eating plums. We were eating blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries will come off pretty soon. I just love it. This was kind of like the dream was getting the infrastructure set up. Like I didn't even, I didn't realize or plan on getting an orchard actually planted this year or actually planting the raspberries. So all of it feels like this big giant bonus. It's so awesome. Also, one other note about these, they are clingstone. I don't know though, what kind of plums aren't clingstone? So the flesh, that means the flesh sticks to the pit. Okay, right in front of the plum, we have an apricot tree called Harcot, which, you know, the description makes it sounds like, sound like it's amazing and that it's a really sweet fruit, like medium to large size. It did produce a ton of fruit, tons and tons of apric apricots. Like you, I think I might have taken pictures or video or something. We'll put it on the screen if I did, but um, I was not super thrilled with the flavor or texture of this variety. They seem to be kind of on the mild side and a little bit mealy. So before I decide whether or not I'm gonna take this out, I'm gonna leave it in the ground until it fruits next year. We'll try the fruit one more time. And then at that point, we'll make the decision. Because I do have one other apricot in this area. It's actually on this side, it's called a Tilton. And this apricot is the best apricot I've about ever tasted. Um, I guess it's this is like the number one for canning, number one for home orchards, and I will absolutely stand by that description. This tree has already grown a lot, produced a ton of fruit, and the flavor was just so amazing. I guess this is a really good variety for drying too. I haven't tried that yet, but you know, we have a lot of years ahead of us, hopefully, with this tree. So we'll be able to do some experimenting and it is a zone five through nine. Okay, we're gonna jog back to this one here. This is a Red Sensation Bartlett Pear. This tree's had its struggles. You can see I had to cut the leader right off the top of it. It got fire blight, which is very typical of any type of pear in our area. That's why I was happy like with the Honeycrisp because apple trees, crab apples, and pears are most susceptible to blight. And this one is a resistant variety and it does not have it. So anyway, um, that usually spreads in the spring when the trees in bloom, when you have more rainy temperatures. And so I had to cut, like be very careful and cut all the affected branches out and then like clean my clippers between each, each cut and all of that but it's producing and the poor little branches are so weak. I probably should take these off. I probably should, but like, could you guys, could you take these fruit off? I just can't, like they're so close to being ready, possibly, possibly close. Anyway, this one's gonna be tucked behind the flower shed. So I'm kind of happy that of all the trees to have its struggles, this is the one that chose to do it because it will be blocked from view very soon once the flower shed's here. The flower shed will come back to right about here. So there'll be seven and a half foot and then there'll actually be, I think one or two feet between the mature canopy of that pear and the back of the flower shed. Anyway, yeah. And I figured, you know, even if, even if this tree doesn't make it, which it's producing new growth, I'm gonna keep my eye real sharp on it. I thought, ooh, wouldn't it be cool to put some double doors on the back of the flower shed and like have a little secret garden space back here with like a wall fountain and some vines and some other things. That would be really fun. All right, so next to the red Bartlett pear, we have an Alberta peach right here, which has several fruit on it. I'm really excited. It kind of like thinned itself out. It had a bunch of fruit set on it earlier this spring. You can see kind of those little green fruit there. And um, yeah, it doesn't appear like it needs a lot of help from me in the thinning department, which is nice. But this is a vigorous grower, um, a zone five. And these are a really good, sweet, rich peach, really fine grained, really fragrant, uh, free stone. So they're great for canning and preserving and fresh eating, all those things. It's one of the top sellers down at the garden center for sure. And then right next to that one, we have a Snow Beauty white peach, which needs to be thinned, but you guys, it is so hot out here. I think I'm gonna do that this evening. <laughs> but you can, look at that wasp, God, see? There's just wasps everywhere. Um, you can see the fruit there, the beautiful uh, red skin on those. And it's just heavy producer, you can tell that already. But this one is a white, fleshed peach, really sweet, and one of the top like rated white peaches out there. Look at how many fruit are on this tree. Dang. Definitely needs some attention there. This one is also a freestone, which to me is important. I want the peaches to come off the pit really easily. So anyway, 
We're in the back corner now of the orchard. You can kind of see the line up here. Now the plan is you can see the water. I'll talk about the apple here in a second, but the water system, they're just drip right to the trees. So we're not like wasting water on any of this yet because we're not set up to like ready to plant this yet. Um, so we have the water line coming over and then we did a ring of the quarter inch brown drip tube around each one. You can see how well they're watering. I mean, each tree is getting an uh, ample amount of water. So I think they're really liking the situation back here. The plan is to get the shed in and then we're gonna put sprinklers in here and we're gonna get a kind that actually comes up out of the ground like by a foot. So I can plant a bunch of bulbs and a kind of a meadowy grass in here so that all of these trees are just like, it just looks very natural in here, I think. I think it will help keep everything cool and all of that too. So our last tree is a Fuji apple. Fujis are just a really good apple overall. There's several on this tree. See all those? Kind of just on the east side of the tree, which is weird, but they look really good. I did the dormant application of spray on these, but I haven't done any in-season spraying, which is amazing. I haven't noticed any insect damage yet either on any of these fruit. So this one is supposed to be a really good keeper. So storage life is really good for this variety. Uh, the only issue with this one is it's a zone six, which we technically are considered a zone six right now, but we oftentimes get zone five winters. So we're just gonna have to see how this one does. We do have a lot of Fujis in our area. A lot of people grow them, so I think I'm gonna be okay. Uh, but it's just one of those things. We're gonna just have to see how it goes. So that is the orchard. Now we're gonna move back to the shade. I'm up underneath a shade tree, but the sun went behind a cloud. So it's a lot more pleasant, which is awesome. I can maybe get out this evening and get that white peach tree thinned. I also need to go thin out my uh, grandparents' white peach tree. You know, I was recently there and thinned their pluot and he said, oh my goodness, it almost looks like you haven't thinned it because the fruit have sized up so much since you did that. So it might be kind of fun to take you guys there and show you uh, in a different on a different day different video show you what the pluots are looking like and then I will tackle getting his peach tree thinned and his peach tree is pretty big so it's gonna take me a while but anyway thank you guys so much for watching this video I hope it was helpful just to see how things are looking especially after such a long stretch of heat um, and then they all of a sudden got the influx of water I mean we got so much and our soil is just not ready to receive it that it was just flooding everywhere around here and I'm not gonna complain because it, it is nice to have a very deep saturating rain like that um, because we just don't get it very often. So anyway, that's it for today's video. Thanks again for watching. See you in the next one. Bye.